Okay, so welcome everyone to the TS Colloquium at the Hebrew University. Uh, we're extremely happy to have uh, Yuval Filmus with us. Yuval is a faculty member at the Technion Computer Science uh, uh, Department. He completed his PhD, award-winning PhD at the University of Toronto. And since then he's at the Technion, as I said, he won the Alon Fellowship and the Creel Prize. Uh, he mostly works on computational complexity, Boolean function analysis, combinatorics, and things like that. And we're extremely happy to have him. And the stage is yours, Yuval, good luck. Thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, so this is about uh, the game of 20 questions, which I will explain in a moment. And this is a joint work with a bunch of people with uh, interesting affiliations. So there's Yuval Degan, who uh, was my master's student, and now he's doing his PhD uh, at MIT. Ariel Gabizon, who uh, used to be at Zcash, and now he's at large, and he's somewhere around the globe. Uh, Daniel Kane, uh, he's in UCSD, and Chai Moran, who's actually uh, now also at the Technion, at the math department. Okay, so this is based on, on two different papers, uh, one of which was accepted just a few months ago. So that's the excuse. But actually, the work is uh, based from a few years ago. Okay, so what is the game of 20 simple questions? So let's start with the game of 20 questions. So this is uh, like a parlor game, a party game. Uh, so maybe originally, uh, let's say I'm playing with Ilan. So I'm thinking of an object. And Ilan's goal is to discover this object. It's a cooperative game. OK, so Ilan can ask me um, yes, no questions. And using these yes, no questions, he's supposed to, uh, to figure out what object I'm thinking about. And, and this is a, a cooperative game. So um, I have to answer truthfully, but there's no cheating. So I can't like wink or something. Okay, so this is the game of 20 questions. Uh, and yeah, maybe even at this point, so suppose that, that Elon uh, plays perfectly. So is he going to discover the object or not? So on, on what does it depend on? So it depends on how many objects I can think of, right? So what's the threshold? Uh, what's the threshold of the number of objects I can think of uh, for Elon to win with, uh, with a perfect strategy? We'll keep that in mind and we'll see the answer in a second. Okay, so concretely, um, we will think of this uh, circuit object as a number from one to n. Okay, maybe that's a bit uh, more boring than just thinking about an object in the world, but it will be slightly easier to work with. So uh, Bob thinks of a number between one to n. And then Alice, uh, his goal is to find a number by asking yes, no questions. And as I said in, in the vanilla, game of 20 questions, uh, it's a completely cooperative game. Yeah, so um, you can think of it as a kind of a communication scenario where Alice and Bob, their, their uh, joint goal is, is for Bob to transfer some, some number from one to n to Alice. And the, the only way, the only protocol in which they can communicate is by asking these yes, no questions. Okay, and now uh, let me ask you, what is the optimal worst case number of rounds? So how many questions does Alice need to ask to discover the unknown number? That's a question to you. Log base two of n. Log base two of n. Okay, so that, that wasn't too hard. Uh, and of course, this game is a bit boring. Um, so in the literature, there are several ways of making it more interesting. Uh, perhaps the, the most um, celebrated way is by allowing Bob to lie. Okay, the, the various uh, ways in which Bob can be allowed to lie. So he can be allowed to lie, to lie k times, maybe half the time, maybe half the time in each prefix. Um, okay, uh, but we will concentrate for the moment on, on a different way to make this game more interesting. And this is by making it distributional. Okay, so what does this mean? So now there's uh, some probability distribution mu known to both players. Yeah, that's important. Uh, and Bob samples a number between 1 and 10, according to this probability distribution mu. OK, and now Alice, uh, who knows mu, he attempts to find uh, uh, this unknown number. And his goal is to minimize the expected number of questions. OK, you can think of uh, various other goals, but the goal we consider is to uh, minimize the expected number of questions that Alice asks. And again, Bob doesn't fly. It's a cooperative game. OK, so uh, what's the answer? What's the optimal number of, uh, of questions that Alice needs to ask uh, on average? 
the binary entropy of mu. Binary entropy of mu. Okay, so uh, of course nothing knows all the answers, uh, but that, that's great. It, it's good to to have somebody in the audience who actually knows. Well, what you start lying at some point, uh, well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so actually Nati is uh, is um, correct in spirit, but maybe not in detail. Okay, so it's actually impossible to always guarantee exactly the binary entropy of mu. Okay, so those of you who don't know about binary entropy, I will explain it in a moment, but let me just say, uh, for people who do know what binary entropy is, actually the best strategy for Ellis uh, was found by Huffman in the 50s. Uh, I think it was a kind of a homework exercise or a challenge problem or something that he solved as a student. At least that's the folktale. Okay. And the performance of Hoffman's algorithm is not quite the entropy, but it's almost the entropy. It's between the entropy and the entropy plus one. Okay, and, and now uh, for those of you who don't know what entropy is, so first of all, let me say that you should uh, look it up because this is something uh, very useful. Okay, and, and here's a way to define entropy uh, using this 20 questions game. So suppose we run many different instances of the 20 questions game in parallel using the same distribution mu. So Bob, instead of sampling a, sim a single number between one to n according to mu, now he's sampling a million numbers. And Ellis is still using yes, no questions, but now he wants to find all of these numbers. Okay, now we take the optimal strategy and we calculate the amortized number of questions per game. So we, in this case, we divide the, number, the expected number of questions by a million. And as this million tends to infinity, then, then so the optimal number of questions is going to tend to entropy of mu. Okay, so this is a definition of entropy of mu. And there's also a formula that we will see uh, at some later point. Okay, so you can find this uh, distribution 20 questions game in classic textbooks on information theory, such as uh, Covered and Thomas, Elements of Information Theory. Okay, so it seems like this problem is solved. So um, I haven't described Huffman's algorithm, but this is a, an extremely efficient algorithm that uh, is actually used in practice uh, and you can run it. It takes like n log n time, uh, it's highly efficient. So it seems like uh, um, everything is known. Um, so why am I giving this talk, okay? So th there's one point which is still uh, like uh, not perfect uh, in, in this uh, setup. And this is the questions that Huffman's algorithm uh, can tell Alice to ask, okay? So these questions can sometimes be complicated, arbitrarily complicated, okay? So for example, uh, for some distribution mu, then Huffman's algorithm might have Alice ask, is X a prime number? Okay, and this is actually a somewhat reasonable question. It could be even, even less reasonable. It could be completely arbitrary, okay? So you can actually show that um, you can arrange from mu such that you can ask almost any question as the first question. Okay, and, and this is, you can see that um, if you actually think of it as a communication game, then if it takes at least so long just to describe the question, then um, this, this is something to be desired. Okay, so uh, our main research question is the following. What can we do if we only restrict ourselves to simple questions? Okay, this is the, uh, the source of the title, 20 simple questions. Okay, and now you can ask, uh, when is a question considered simple? Okay, so I'll give you two answers. So one answer, a question is simple, like if it's simple, then I can recognize it. So it's, it's uh, like they say about some other stuff. Uh, you recognize a simple question when you see it. Okay, so uh, for example, the question is X prime uh, is not so simple, whereas uh, the question, is x at most five is pretty simple. Okay, so this is a, this will be one answer uh, that we will actually see in a moment. Uh, and the other answer, uh, we'll say that an, an ensemble of questions is simple if it's small. Okay, so if I can ask uh, one of a uh, hundred many questions, then this is simpler than if I can ask one of a million many questions. Okay, so these are two interpretations uh, for the words, for the adjective simple. Okay, and here's an example of the first interpretation. And this is uh, something that hopefully all of you are familiar with, uh, binary search trees. Okay, so what's a binary search tree? Then um, there is some array uh, and we want to, we get, we're given an element and we want to find whether it's in the array. 
Okay, this is one version. Uh, other versions uh, want, us, uh, want us to locate it uh, either as an element of the array or between two elements of the array or before the first element or after the last element. Okay, so we will consider the variant where we're looking for an element which actually is in the array. Okay, and what kind of queries are we allowed to ask? So let's say that the, this unknown element that we're searching, we call it X, and we're allowed to ask questions of the form, is X smaller than three or at least three? Is X smaller than two or at least two? And so on. Yeah, these are two-way questions. Uh, you can also find in the literature three-way questions, like is X smaller than two, equal to two, or larger than two? But uh, this is somewhat uh, less useful and we won't consider it because in our setup, all the questions have two answers. Okay, so this is a binary search tree. Uh, and now we can ask, what is the performance of an optimal binary search tree on a given distribution view? And again, we want to minimize the expected number of questions. Okay, so for, uh, for an arbitrary decision tree with arbitrary questions, we said it's somewhere between entropy and entropy plus one. Now, what's, what's the uh, counterpart for binary search trees? What do you think? Log n. Okay, log n can be always achieved, but uh, um, now imagine that I give you some distribution mu and, and you have to, to construct a, this, uh, a binary search tree, which is uh, designed uh, to work with respect to mu. So your goal is that the expected number of question asked so when uh, this, the element is distributed according to mu is minimized. Okay, so it's true that you can always achieve log n, but maybe you can achieve something better. The, the median every time is probably the best, but I don't know how to prove this. Okay, so uh, actually the optimal algorithms for generating the optimal binary search trees are not so uh, clean. Okay, there, there's some very tricky algorithms uh, that run in, uh, I think order n log n, but they're more complicated than repeatedly defining the median. Okay, so actually we'll, we'll see algorithms very similar to what you're describing in a moment, uh, but they're not optimal. They're what are known as heuristic algorithms in the literature. Uh, but still, uh, the algorithm itself doesn't matter. The question is, what is the performance? Can I guarantee, for example, entropy plus one, uh, like we can do with Huffman's algorithm? The trouble is with elements that weigh a lot, right? I mean, otherwise, right. otherwise you really cut at the median. That, that would be really... Mm -hmm. Right, so Nadia is exactly right. Uh, imagine a distribution which is 99% uh, two and 0.5% uh, one, 0.5% three. Uh, then the entropy is roughly zero, okay? Because I'm very, very certain that the answer is two. But it takes me two, ans two questions to isolate, to uh, uh, certify that the answer is actually two, like in, in this uh, surgery that you can see here. So this is an example where the entropy is about zero, but the expected number of questions is about two. Okay, and, and this turned out to be uh, like the, the worst possible case. So Gilbert and Moore um, showed that you can always achieve entropy of mu plus two. Yeah, this is all, also got by various other names, like I don't remember them right now, but this is uh, very similar to arithmetic coding and to some other stuff. And we'll actually see this algorithm in a moment. It's very similar to what you suggested. Okay, like I said, this is optimal for, for these uh, very boring distributions, uh, which are concentrated on a single element. And at some later point, uh, if there's still time, then I will talk about what happens when we rule out these uh, boring distributions. Okay, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to give you, to describe to you this Gilbert and Moore algorithm uh, uh, and analyze it. And we'll also see a different algorithm, uh, which is, might look very similar, but actually is a bit different uh, and also gives the same guarantee of entropy of mu plus two. Okay, and you can ask why, why am I comparing myself to entropy rather than let's say uh, the optimal strategy. So we will see why uh, in a few slides. Okay. So here's the Gilbert Moore algorithm. Um, it's just binary search over the interval zero one. So here's the deal. So we have this uh, probability distribution mu, 
and I denote the probability of the element i by mu of i. Okay, so since this is the probability distribution, then the sum of, of these mu i's uh, has to be one. Okay, this is the definition of uh, probability distribution. Okay, so now I can partition the interval zero one into subintervals uh, whose length is mu of i. So the ith interval has length mu of i. And I put this blue dot at the middle of each interval. And this blue, blue dot is going to represent uh, the element i. So for example, uh, this, uh, this dot that I just highlighted, it represents the point five. Okay, and now I'm just going to do binary search. So here's how it goes. So we first ask whether the input is in the left half or in the right half, okay? So this point four, it's actually located at half plus epsilon. So here, the question I'm asking is, is the input element less than four or at least four? Okay, and you can see that this is the sort of question that you can uh, uh, ask in a binary search tree. Okay, so in this case, we're looking for the element five. So this unknown element uh, is, is five. So the answer is larger than uh, three or at least four. Okay, and then we do the same thing. Uh, we ask, is it in the left half or in the right half? So this time uh, the answer is in the left half. Uh, and, and finally, um, well, we do again the same thing and we need to have one more round because of this uh, point number four is, is right, uh, is just to the right of one half. Okay, so it took us three rounds to find the element. So again, this was the first round. Now we go right, here we go left. And here we go right. Okay, so this is the Gilbert Moore algorithm, and we'll analyze it in the next slide. You'll see that the analysis is quite simple. And here is another algorithm. Uh, it's named after Risanen and uh, analyzed uh, by Hoiberg. Okay, so Risanen, you could only show that it's entropy plus three, and then this was improved to entropy plus two. Okay, and, and the only reason I'm presenting it is because we will need it later. Okay, so this is a very, very similar algorithm. Maybe um, it's more similar to uh, asking about the median, okay? So here's the rule. At any given point in time, we ask the most informative question. Now, what do I mean by the most informative question? So for any question, there is a certain probability that the answer will be yes, and a certain probability that the answer will be no. And we want this question to give us the, the most information about the unknown element. Okay, so now you can measure information in many different ways. So here I'm really looking at mutual information, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, what is clear is that the, the most informative question is the question with the most balanced answer. So when the probabilities of the both answers are as close to one another as possible or as close to one half as possible, which is the same thing. Okay, so as an example, in this case, here's the first question. Well, we're still looking for element number five. So this is the first question. Is, does it belong to the, the red group or to the yellow group? Okay, so I'm asking the most informative question, but not among all questions, only among uh, these ordered questions. Okay, as an aside, um, you might think uh, that one way to construct an optimal decision tree, so in the setting when we're allowed to ask whatever question we want, is using this approach, but uh, going over all possible questions. Okay, but this is actually not how Hoffman's algorithm works. So this is a top-down approach, uh, and in contrast, the Hoffman's algorithm is a bottom-up approach. Okay, it's not so intuitive, but uh, that's uh, that's life. Okay, so now back to this algorithm. So I'm asking the the most balanced question, and again the answer is uh, go to the right. And now I'm asking the most informative question, and and this time the answer is go to the left, and it terminates within two steps. So the first question is sort of uh, the same as in the gilbert muller algorithm, but uh, from the second question and on, then it's a bit different. Okay, so at any point in time, there are the, the points which are still in play. And um, among these points, we cut them in the middle and in the place which is closest to one half. So it's like looking at the median and we ask the most balanced question. And we repeat until we isolate the unknown element. So this is the Risan and Hoibe algorithm. And both of the algorithms in the slide, uh, in the worst case, their performance is at most the entropy plus two on average. 
Okay. So what I'm going to do now, unless there are questions, I'm going to uh, describe how to analyze the Gilbert Moore algorithm, just because the analysis is uh, so simple. Okay. So let's say uh, I'm looking for element number five. Then one thing to notice, if I measure the distance between um, the dot representing element five and the endpoints of the interval, uh, then the distance is exactly uh, its probability over two. And in particular, the distance to the, the next uh, blue dot to the right and to the left is at least mu of five over two. Okay, so this is maybe uh, one of the important observations in the analysis. Okay, so now what's happening? So this is the first question that we ask. And after answering this question, then we've isolated uh, the interval containing uh, the element to a, a subinterval of size one half. And then we go down to size one fourth and so on. So every time the size of the interval shrinks by uh, a factor of two. Okay, so after k rounds, then we zero in on an interval of length two to the minus k. Okay, and this interval is guaranteed to contain this uh, red point. Uh, and the game stop, we know the answer once this interval does not contain any other point. So when does this happen? After log of the shortest interval. Roughly, okay. So this happens uh, once the interval has length at most mu of x over two. Okay, so we have this interval that all we know about it is it contains this uh, red dot. So once the length of the interval is at most mu of five over two, then we know for sure that it doesn't contain any other point. Okay, so at that point, uh, we can for sure stop the game. Okay, and that means that we have to stop after a seeding of two over mu of x uh, rounds, which works out uh, in the worst case to be roughly log of one of the probability plus two. Okay, so this is a sort of a worst case guarantee which depends on the probability of the element. Now, those of you who know uh, um, the formula for entropy, then they can immediately see that if I take expectation over x, then they can I get exactly the entropy plus two. And this is because the entropy of mu is exactly the, expect, the expected value of log of one over mu of x over x. Okay, so this was the entire analysis. It's a, it's a very simple algorithm and the analysis is very simple. Uh, unfortunately, the analysis of the other algorithm, the one which repeatedly asks the most informative question, while it's not um, very complicated, it's a lot less elementary and like I wouldn't even be able to tell you how it, how it goes. So um, that's why I'm only presenting the analysis of this algorithm, even though the actual algorithm we'll use in the future is the other one. Okay, so this is maybe something which is good to know and you can present it in, in class if you teach something uh, like, let's say binary search trees. Okay, so this is all about the Gilbert Moore algorithm. Uh, the analysis of arithmetic coding is, is um, I think, very similar. It's maybe even identical. And now what we do, okay? So if you recall the, um, maybe let, let's go uh, um, one bit back. So what, what is the issue with these two algorithms um, that um, I'm describing this slide? Then both of them, they guarantee uh, entropy of mu plus two. Okay, but the guarantee of Huffman's algorithm is entropy of mu plus one, which is better by one question. Okay, and our goal in life now is to get um, another algorithm, which also guarantees entropy plus one, matching Huffman's algorithm, but uses only simple questions, whatever that means. Okay, and, and we'll see why the difference between plus two and plus one is not as slight as might seem at first glance. Okay, so now uh, the question is, which questions do we need to, uh, to add to this uh, binary search tree paradigm in order to be able to get entropy plus one? So what was the issue with uh, binary search trees? 
So we had these funding distributions, which are have entropy very close to zero because it's very certain, let's say in this case, that the element is two. But we can only, in order to be sure that the answer is two, we need to ask at least two questions. Yeah, because it takes two smaller than questions to isolate a, a given element. So how can we fix that? Which questions would we need to, uh, to add in order to be able to analyze uh, distributions of this sort? Is it the big guy? Is it the big guy? Okay, so how does this question look like? Quality it's questions. Quality questions, right? So, Right, so um, what we get is what was known in the literature, in some literature, as binary split trees, okay? So uh, I have to say, uh, uh, back in the day, I had a very extensive literature review, like maybe 10 pages, and so I was able to find all these uh, terms that nobody uses. And one of them is binary split trees. Okay, this is the same as binary search trees, uh, but they allow not only questions of the form is x less than 2 or at least 2, but also questions of the form is x exactly equal to two. Okay, another term which might mean the same thing is binary comparison search trees. Um, so this concept comes up in the data structure uh, literature um, at some point. Okay, so if we have these questions, then at least there is some hope that we can uh, get down to entropy plus one for every distribution. Okay, and that's exactly what we show. That's one of our main results that using uh, uh, the optimal binary split tree, we can get entropy plus one always. Okay, and this improves the binary search trees, which only get entropy plus two. Okay, and, and here's the algorithm which achieves it. It's actually quite simple. So uh, there are two cases. So if the big guy has probability at least 0.3, where 0.3 is a, a somewhat arbitrary, but not too arbitrary, threshold, then we ask about the, the big guy. And otherwise we ask the most informative um, less than question. Okay, so this is the entire algorithm. So it's like this uh, Rissan and Hoibe algorithm, but it has this extra clause about the big guy. Okay, th this point three, you can slightly play with it. Like uh, it also works if you use a point two nine nine, but it doesn't work if you use it on a point four. Okay, so you can see that this algorithm is uh, kind of uh, simple um, and elegant. Uh, the analysis, unfortunately, is not as simple and elegant, but um, um, it's hopefully mathematically correct, so at least we know that it works. Now there is a question, uh, how to find the optimal binary split tree? Uh, I think the best algorithm is maybe order n to the four. So, so that's open, but you always know that there's at least one binary split tree. Let's say the one uh, corresponding to this algorithm whose performance is at most entropy plus one. Yeah, so uh, this is exactly the question that Nati was uh, asking about. Yeah, we will not present the analysis of this algorithm because we don't really understand it. It's a bit uh, tricky and like it, it works, but um, it's kind of a zero knowledge proof. Okay, now let so, me explain, yeah. So there's no intuition for where this point three comes up? Okay, so I mean, there is an, uh, some intuition. Um, yeah, so, so, so the way the analysis works is we compare, um, Okay, so if you were always able to ask a, a question which is exactly half-half, then using the chain rule of entropy, then you can show that the performance of your algorithm is exactly the entropy. Okay, so in this case, there's uh, some kind of loss because the question is not exactly balanced. Okay, so what we do is, is we keep track of the, the probability of the big guy and we kind of uh, trade off uh, this loss to the how this big guy behaves. And I think you can you can show that um, a threshold like 0.4 won't work even by looking just at uh, what happens when the big guy is, is really big. Okay, so there is some information on the threshold that you can get from this. Uh, but but for the rest of the analysis, um, I mean, for 0.3 it works. It might also work for other thresholds, but we cannot show it. Um, 
So you don't have an attack for point 0.4. You just don't know how to prove that it works. Yeah, yeah. So th there are some thresholds which I know don't work and some thresholds which uh, I cannot prove work, but uh, they might. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yuval, isn't it just that you're trying to make up for, for these lost questions? So when you wrote point 0.3, I thought that really the number should be a quarter because you're wasting two questions on the big guy. Mm -hmm. This is this plus two, and from now on, you've eliminated it, and then you pay two to cut it by by, by an additive quarter. This is not true, this, this argumentation. Yeah, I'm not sure. So uh, the analysis, there's something a bit subtle uh, that you need to keep track of this, uh, that's the biggest element. Uh, so, and this complicates things. So I, I'm not sure, like, I, we haven't looked for counterexamples showing that, let's say, 0.25 uh, won't work, but um, it's, it's possible that you might be able to show it. Yeah, but if somebody in, in the crowd is willing to take a look at the paper and find a better analysis that will like, explain why 0.3 is a good threshold, then uh, I would be very happy. So there's no general version yet. So you can, uh, if you find a better analysis, uh, you might be part of the project even. Yeah, something to look forward to. Okay, so now uh, briefly, why do we care? Um, so I think it's an interesting question, but you can say the difference between plus two and plus one is kind of uh, not so important, uh, especially because it's only really relevant for these uh, distributions which are not so interesting. So here's my answer. Uh, so in real life, here's something that could happen. So it could be uh, that maybe this N is very, very large. Like maybe the number that you're looking at is uh, 128 bits long. Okay, so of course the supporter for distribution is not uh, 2 to the 128. So uh, the way you're going to um, implement your binary uh, search or binary split tree is by looking at individual words. Okay, so you're doing it in chunks. You first find the first 32 bits, or maybe nowadays it's, it will be 64 bits. And then the following 32 bits, uh, the following 32 bits, and finally the final 32 bits. Okay, so we're discovering uh, these parts of the unknown number in chunks. Okay, so if you use uh, binary search trees, you're going to lose uh, two questions in the worst case per chunk. Whereas in our algorithm, you're going to lose one question per chunk. Okay, so here's what could uh, what the transcript of the algorithm could look like. I just made it up. Yeah, so um, if you have W different chunks, then in the worst case, so if you run our, our algorithm on each chunk iteratively, then you're guaranteed at most and at the entropy plus W. Okay, uh, and here is the, the number of potential questions we could ask. Okay, so there's a factor W. Uh, this, this is for the number of different words. Uh, each of the words that are n to the one over W possibilities. Okay, because n is just the, the total number of uh, integers we consider. And then each of the words, uh, it has, um, it could be one of n to the one over w numbers, and I'm asking uh, two types of question per number, like uh, smaller than or equals to. So that's why we have two. Uh, and now, why am I displaying this uh, this uh, monstrosity here? Because we have an almost matching lower bound. Okay, so up to this constant two, and everything else that you see here is actually uh, it's necessary. So if you want to guarantee redundancy w, so entropy plus w, for every mu then you need at least uh, some constant times w times n to the one over w questions. Okay, this we can prove. And uh, just one minute about the lower bound is you're looking at these uh, boring distributions which are concentrated on a single element. And you do the math and that's what you get. Okay, so in, in order to, to obtain this matching upper bound, it's really important to have a plus one per chunk rather than plus two per chunk. Okay, so, so that's my, my spiel uh, for why this is interesting to reduce from plus two to plus one, because this way we actually got, uh, obtained the best um, simplicity in terms of number of questions for every redundancy W. Yeah, we don't know what's the optimal constant. Uh, this is also something which will be interesting to figure out. So uh, we think maybe the upper bound can be improved and also the lower bound uh, 
And getting a better constant is actually a bit non-trivial and requires some result of uh, volume machine. Okay, so any questions about that before I go on to some other stuff? Okay. Uh, so um, now we're going to talk about playing 20 questions with a liar. And this is the title of a classic paper by I think Peter Winkler et al. Uh, as I said, there are many different uh, ways of um, allowing lies. We're going to consider uh, one of them and you can consider the others. Yeah, there's uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, research that can still be done here. So here we still have Bob. And now let, let's start with the non-distributional question. Okay, so now Bob thinks of an arbitrary number between one and n. Okay. And Alice again uh, wants to find number by asking yes and no questions. Now the complication is we allow Bob to like k times where k is some constant within a bit. Let's say k is equal to 10. Okay. And now the, the question is, um, by how much does the number of questions that Alice asks in the worst case needs to increase to accommodate this? So we know that if k is zero, then the answer is log n. What's the answer if k is one? What's the answer if k is two? Is it related to interactive coding? Uh, yeah, yeah. So that, that's a good point. Uh, the techniques that we will use later are, are very similar to interactive coding, and probably you can improve some constants using interactive coding. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that, that's, a, that's a good question. Yeah, so by how much does the number of, uh, what's the penalty that uh, Alice has to pay by allowing Bob to lie k times? It's like a test your intuition. So does he need to pay, I don't know, log n questions per uh, lie or order one questions per lie or something in the middle? What do you think? If, if k is one, then you're basically looking for where, where he lied. So I think it should be something like log log n, right, the, 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 the penalty. Okay, and in case two? It's the same thing. Okay, so we'll see that later on, uh, exactly this explanation. So very good, a very good intuition. So the optimal cost is something like log n plus k log log n, at least for constant k. Okay, and that's exactly because this log log n, it encodes the position of the line. We'll see that in a, in a moment. Okay, and, and now let's look at the distributional version. So this, we believe, has not been considered in the past for some reason. But you know, in combinatorics, you can think of a million different questions, and Erdush only thought about of half of them. Okay, so this belongs to the other half. <laughs> okay, so it's exactly the same setup. And now we have distribution mu, and Bob chooses x according to mu. And Alice wants to find x, uh, and Bob is allowed to lie k times. Okay, uh, and, and now we're asking what's the optimal number of uh, questions, roughly, in, in, on average, not in the worst case, but on average. Okay, so if k is zero, then it was entropy of mu. And now it's going to be entropy of mu plus k times, times something. Okay, so this something, uh, when you use the uniform distribution, which corresponds to what we've seen earlier, is log log n. So the question is, what replaces log log n for an arbitrary distribution mu? So we know what replaces log n. The log n is, corresponds to the entropy. Uh, what replaces log log n? Wild well, guess, what was the answer Okay, so um, it's something similar, but uh, not quite, not quite. Uh, so you should think of it uh, per element. So you're thinking of, of it like an, on average, but the right way to think of it is, is per element. So we have a given element, and now the, uh, the number of questions needed is roughly log one over its probability. Okay, and then when you take uh, the average, then we get entropy. So here's going to be something very similar. Okay, so it's going to be, okay, um, yeah, the entropy plus k times something. And this something is, is the average over, uh, over mu of, of some quantity. And the question is, what is this quantity? 
So if the entropy is the average of uh, log of one over mu, then what's H2? It's the average of what? This is Remy entropy? No, no, this is a notation we invented because uh, I, I don't think this has a name. Uh, I think we did find it at uh, some data structures paper, but uh, I, I'd be happy to find uh, where it else appears. So this is the expected value of log log one over mu. Yeah, it's something which I think is reasonably natural. I mean, it's, it's the right answer for us, but it's also like reasonably natural. I, I'm not sure it corresponds to any of the usual entropies, so for any value of the parameter, uh, although maybe. Uh, but this is the answer here, and we'll see why in a second. Um, but first, let me explain uh, how to get this using an algorithm, and this will be very similar to interactive coding, uh, I think. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to do Gilbert Moore with lies. Now, if you recall, then Gilbert Moore is not optimal because it's plus two rather than plus one, but uh, at this point, we don't care so much about these lower order terms. Okay, so maybe it can be optimized further, but uh, yeah, this is beyond uh, our pay grade. Okay, so we're just going to run the Gilbert Moore algorithm and we're going to be sensitive to the possibility of Bob line. Okay, and let me remind you that the Gilbert Moore algorithm is just uh, you do binary search on the interval zero one. And these blue dots, uh, they represent the locations of elements. Okay, so let's say again, we're looking for element number five. Okay, so that's the first question. Uh, and although Bob should have uh, said red, uh, Bob is saying yellow. Okay, so then we ask this question, what would be the answer? Assuming Bob it doesn't fly. Red. Red. Okay, now? Red. Red. Now? Red. Red. We'll be always red, okay? So uh, how do we recognize a lie? Then if at some point the answer is always the same, then uh, probably Bob lie. Okay, so this is the idea. So if this happens, then we figure out what the true answer is. And this is by asking enough questions to prevent Bob from lying. Like if we ask at least two K plus one question, then we take the majority, then the answer is definitely correct. Okay, and then if we discover that Bob lied, then we just erase everything on the, the, from this last position that we know Bob was right up to the current position, and we try again. Okay, so th this is the entire algorithm. Okay, and I need to, to describe like uh, how many uh, um, identical answers uh, look suspicious, but um, yeah, up to this, uh, up to this detail, it's, it's the, the entire algorithm. So again, so we uh, record the answers. And if at some point we see this very long run of answers which are exactly the same, then we become suspicious. Uh, and, and we uh, kind of go to the previous question uh, before this one. And then we, we ask again the question that we asked uh, back then for enough time so that Bob cannot lie. Okay, we find the correct answer by asking the question enough time and taking majority. And then if we discover that Bob lied, we just roll back all this entire interaction which was completely useless to us. Okay, this is very similar to things that, uh, that uh, indeed happen in interactive coding. And if you do this with the correct parameters, then you get uh, entropy plus K H2 of mu, roughly. Okay, now, now let me try to convince you why this H2 of mu is correct. And actually the, this argument was already said here. So uh, here's the lower bound, uh, and this will explain where this log log one over mu comes from. So, after we figure out the, the right answer, then we know this uh, unknown element X, but because we also know all the answers, then Alice also knows the positions where Bob lied. Okay, so she can determine from the transcript and from the value of X, also the positions where Bob lied. And these positions, they carry a lot of entropy in them. Okay, so we know that the game lasts for roughly log one over many rounds. So each uh, position where Bob lied, uh, it can be any of uh, this log one over mu positions. So it takes log one, one over mu questions to, uh, to reveal. Okay, so if you wanted to formalize it, then this would be like you're going to measure some entropy, um, but this is the idea. Yeah, because the only way for Alice to know the answer is, is to also know the position for Bob Lied, and, and, and this is uh, some additional information that, that she has to, uh, to figure out. 
Okay, so, so this is the lower bound. This shows that you need at least uh, entropy of mu plus k times entropy two of mu. Uh, and the upper bound we've just seen, but uh, just a, a bit about where, where the parameters come from. So the only point which wasn't completely uh, specified in this algorithm is uh, how long uh, of a run uh, will look susp suspicious, okay? So on the one hand, uh, if, if, we, uh, if we look for a run which are too long, then the cost of uh, rolling back might be too high. Okay, so if we if we look for a, like an extremely long run of uh, of uh, identical answers, then once Bob lies, then we're kind of doomed. On the other hand, if if uh, th this uh, run is too short, then we we might get too many false positives. Okay, so even when Bob is not lying, we might suspect that he's lying. Okay, so this is something we need to balance, and it turns out that the optimal choice is roughly uh, the log of the current number of questions, which is. Uh, for most of the time, it will be roughly log log one over mu. Yeah, this is some calculation that you need to do. And this is why you get uh, this extra log log one over mu per lie because of this rolling back. Okay, so you have to roll back this uh, suspicious interval and, and this is exactly what you lose. Okay, there are a lot more details um, as it's common in this uh, genre, but um, this is uh, kind of the idea. I think that there are still some lower order parameters which we were not able to optimize completely because we ran out of steam. Um, but otherwise, we kind of know the answer to reasonable accuracy. And this is, again, this algorithm that I described. It's, um, eventually, it's quite simple. It's not too hard to implement. So you can imagine somebody actually implementing it if, if there's some scenario where it's reasonable. Okay, so this is about line. And now let me briefly go over um, two more parts. I will be a bit brief because I'm uh, not really running out of time, but, but how, when do you want me to end? Uh, in uh, something like 10 minutes at most. Yeah, okay, great. So now I'll, I'll throw upon you even more information, but we'll do it uh, more briefly. Okay, so one question which I find very interesting is uh, how to match Hoffman's algorithm exactly. Okay, so up to now we've been comparing ourselves to the entropy, but you can also compare yourself to uh, the performance of Hoffman's algorithm. And you can ask, is there a smaller set of questions? Okay, and you have to commit to this uh, set of questions before seeing the distribution mu, such that using only this set of questions, you can always match the performance of Hoffman's algorithm exactly. Okay, uh, so yeah, I'll be a bit brief, but uh, just uh, one thing. Uh, it's enough to look at these dyadic distributions, which are distributions uh, where all the probabilities are negative powers of two. And the reason is you take an arbitrary distribution and you construct this optimal strategy. In this case, it's a binary split tree, but it could be whatever. Uh, and then uh, you can construct a new distribution where the probability of an element is uh, proportional to the, to the depth to the number of questions you need to ask in order to reveal it. And then if you can handle this new distribution that you're gonna, uh, exactly, then you can actually also handle the original distribution. Okay, if anybody knows uh, about uh, terminology for these distributions where all the elements, uh, all the probabilities are negative powers of two, I will also be very happy to know because we couldn't find a standard term for this. Okay, and now it turns out that um, in order to handle these distributions, all you need to do is to come up with a set of questions with the following property. So for every dyadic distribution, you need to be able to split it in half exactly. Okay, so this is something we discussed previously with median and, and stuff. So for arbitrary distributions, this will in general be impossible, but for these dyadic distributions, this is always possible, it turns out. Okay, so in this case, uh, this is one solution. Okay, so now your goal in life is to construct a collection of subsets of the numbers one to n with this property that for any non-constant uh, dead distribution, so when all probabilities are negative powers of two, you can always find a set whose probability is exactly one half. Okay, and here is such a construction. 
you take all the subsets of uh, the numbers one to n over two plus all the subsets of uh, numbers n over two plus one to n. Uh, and here's very, quick, very quickly why it works. So first of all, either the left half or the right half has probability at least one half. Okay, let's say uh, the left half. Then we arrange the elements in non-increasing order. And there's some prefix which will sum exactly to one half. Okay, so it's not too hard to see. And this is one way to come up with a set of questions, which is a lot smaller than, than all questions, but which allows the matching of the performance of Hoffman's algorithm exactly. Okay, so this is a set of questions of size square root to the n, which is the best known explicit construction. And non-explicitly, we can get it down to 1.25 to the n, which is optimal for infinitely many n. And the construction itself is very simple. You just use uh, enough random sets of every possible size, um, but analyzing it is, uh, is more interesting. Uh, and, and to finish off about uh, this part, if you're, uh, so, if you want to match up an algorithm exactly, you need an exponential number of questions, exponential in n. But if you're uh, allowing yourself to pay a small penalty, like an epsilon penalty, then you get down to polynomial. Okay, so I went over this a bit quickly. And now we're going to skip this. You can look at the slides, which are available on my web page. Uh, and now, just a few open questions. So one open question uh, is generalize everything uh, to the case when you have more than two answers per, per question. So, so far we've been talking about yes, no questions, but you can also uh, talk about uh, questions that have three possible answers. And now you can ask, like all of these questions that we asked uh, so far, you can ask about um, this new setup. Okay, and the only thing we know is uh, what happens when you want to match Hoffman's algorithm exactly, and then instead of 1.25, we have some other formula. Okay, so this is one thing you can ask. Another thing you can ask is you allow lies, but now there are different lying models. So maybe you allow up to one tenth of the questions to uh, to be answered by lies, or maybe uh, a, a different by related model is at most few fraction in every prefix. So, so that makes more sense if you, you have an upper bound on the number of questions. Yeah, which maybe in, in R setting um, doesn't make sense for them. So maybe in R setting it's the same thing. Okay, so this we haven't thought about. Uh, it's also very similar to interactive coding, just a very particular type of interactive coding. So probably techniques uh, from there will, will help. Uh, and here we know that there's going to be some thresholds. So both from interactive coding and from playing 20 questions with the liars. So if a P or Q is too large, then this is this will be impossible to solve. Uh, and, but below some point, it will be possible. And at the threshold, like the behavior might be sort of interesting. Yeah, you can ask, uh, this is just a, an example of one of the um, really myriad of possible questions. And this is something which is also considered in the case of Hoffman coding, uh, like what happens if we also put a restriction on the maximum uh, length of a code word? So like we want to minimize the average uh, number of questions uh, subject to some bound in the worst case number of questions. What happens then? And finally, this is something I already uh, mentioned. So if you want to find the optimal binary search tree, then there are these uh, tricky algorithms that work in order n log n. Uh, but the best algorithm for binary split trees uh, um, is some kind of dynamic programming, which works in n to the four, I think, which is better than the obvious thing, which is n to the five. Okay, so can you do better? And there are many, many, many more open questions in uh, one of the versions of the paper on my homepage. So if you... If you're interested, then you're welcome to look and uh, enjoy yourself. Okay, so thanks for listening and I can take any more questions if you have them. Thank you, Val. So any more questions from the audience? Uh, what is this origin of one plus D minus one over D to the D over D minus one? Um, Okay, so for the lower bound, so we get the lower bound of 1.25 to the n out of a, a very structured distributions, which are, so you, so you pick some set S and you have the uniform distribution over the set S. Uh, and then the, the other elements uh, have, have uh, probabilities which decrease exponentially. 
Okay, so uh, you optimize over the size of S and you consider all of the possible S's. And now it's, I think, enough even to look at the first question. So you need to be able to split all of these uh, distributions. So every question of a particular size, it works for um, this many S's. Uh, so that's what you do. And that's how you get 1.25 to the end, the lower bound. So now when you optimize over the size of S, uh, in the general case, then this is what you get. This one plus uh, whatever. And maybe the miracle is that you can match it up to lower order factors using this uh, random constructor. Uh, but this is where it comes from. More questions? Can you explain again why the addic distributions are enough for all these distributions? Yeah, so actually I haven't explained it, but I can do it. So let me just go there. So here's the idea. So uh, you have some mechanism which uh, solves the addict distributions optimally. Okay, and now I want to explain how to solve uh, an arbitrary distribution. Okay, so you take your arbitrary distribution and, and you construct the optimal strategy using, for example, Huffman's algorithm. And you get this kind of tree uh, like we have here. And now you construct a different distribution, okay, where the probability of, of an element uh, i is two to the minus uh, number of questions asked by the algorithm on i. Okay, like in the example here. And, and now you apply your machine that works for the addict distributions and you construct uh, some decision tree, which is optimal for this distribution. Okay, now the claim is that this exact same strategy is also matches Huffman for your original distribution. And the reason is that the only way to be optimal on, on the daily distribution is if the number of questions that you ask for an element of probability two to the minus K is exactly K. Okay, this is something you can show. Okay, so Thanks. what happened here? It's kind of a rounding of an arbitrary distribution into a dyadic distribution in the KL metric. This is a sophisticated way of saying it. Okay, so I think if there's any more questions, uh, you should feel free to contact you while offline. I hope that's okay. Uh, sure. And yeah, so let's thank you, Val, again. It was really, really interesting. So thank you and see you all next week. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.